Right, good evening, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm Ed Green, I'm Chief Executive of Warwickshire Wildlife Trust, and I'd like to very warmly invite you all to our webinar this evening, um, where we're going to explain uh, the background to the Nature Recovery Fund appeal that we launched in the last edition of Wild Warwickshire, which I hope you've all seen, and presumably you have, because you're here tonight. And um, we, I'm very, also really, really pleased to welcome um, John Lawton, um, who I'll introduce a bit in uh, in, in a moment, and uh, my colleague Ian Jelly. Um, he's the one with the beard, and it's the. Three I've got a beard. It's just tidier than his. <laughs> okay, he's the one with the big beard. Um, and the three of us are going to give you um, a, a, a few short, a three short presentations. And then we're going to have a, a, a question and an, an answer session. So, as I said, I'm uh, I'm the chief executive of Warwickshire Wildlife Trust. Ian is our director of living landscapes, and and Sir John is our our, our guest speaker tonight. Um, uh, John John Lawton was chairman of the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution. Um, he's also been the chief executive of the Natural Environment Research Council and director of the Centre for Population Biology at Imperial College. Um, he, he trained as a zoologist at the University of Durham and he was just exchanging a, uh, a couple of anecdotes as about why he selected Durham University and it was all to do with birds that he saw while preparing for interview um, walking the riverbanks there. Um, but he subsequently held posts at Oxford and York universities. His scientific interests focused on the diversity of the living world and its conservation and he's a, a past president of the British Ecological Society a former chairman and currently vice president of RSPB and currently president of the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. But within conservation, uh, the, the, the world of conservation, he's probably best known, I think, for uh, his 2010 report to, to DEFRA, Making Space for Nature, which has had an enormous influence on strategic approaches to nature conservation in the UK ever, ever since. Um, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1989 and awarded a CBE in 1997 and knighted in 2005 for his contribution to ecological science. Um, and last but not least, he's a foreign member of both the US National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So, John, thank you ever so much for joining us tonight um, uh, from, from your home. Uh, over to you then for some introductory remarks to set the scene for our, our Nature Recovery Fund appeal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, actually, I need to do share screen first, don't I? And then we'll do share screen. Let's do that. And then I do this. And then I put it on to here. Come on. There we go. Well, then, thank you for asking me. It's, great, it's good to be with you. I'm going to talk about what I think is a, is a really interesting state that we're in. Probably I'm more excited about where we are with nature conservation now than I've been for a very long time. We're turning the tide. The history of nature conservation in Britain dates back to the early 1900s, in fact, to 1912, when the Honourable Charles Rothschild convened a strategic meeting at the Natural History Museum in London to plan the first nature reserves in England. Uh, and that phase from 1900 to the present day, the preservation of, uh, of protected areas is ongoing and it remains extremely important. I'm not going to say anything about phase two, which started in about the 1950s, but phase three is the deliberate habitat creation outside existing reserves to increase the size and number of protected areas. And that started in about the 1990s. And then, of course, we've entered the phase from about 2000 onwards of rewilding. And together, uh, phase one, phase three and phase four add up to some really very interesting developments uh, that are going on. Uh, I'm just going to talk about terrestrial and freshwater habitats, uh, not marine, because I don't have time. Uh, but despite the long history of traditional nature conservation, starting with Rothschild, the State of Nature report in 2019, the third State of Nature report, shows it just hasn't worked. That's not the, 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 to mean that it's been a waste of time. Just think how much worse it would have been if we hadn't done that. But the State of Nature report, I'm sure many of you have seen, paints a pretty dismal picture of where we are with wildlife conservation in the UK. Um, on the evidence, the report said the UK would miss most of our biodiversity 
biodiversity targets for 2020. We did. We missed 17 of them. And as one rapporteur put it, here are the football results, environmental destruction, 17, nature, three. as an RSPB analysis. And expenditure by government on biodiversity has fallen as a proportion of GDP by over 40 percent since 2009. And there's the graph to show it. But it isn't all about money. There are almost overwhelming forces at work. Why are we doing badly despite all the creation of all these nature reserves? Well, pollution, urbanization, the construction of infrastructure and the sheer press of people all play a part. But the two biggest drivers are climate change and currently well ahead of climate change, agricultural intensification. In the simplest possible terms, the UK's protected area network, impressive as it is, is just too small to stop the rot. But despite that, I now see real signs of hope. I'm more hopeful than I've been for a long time. The impacts of pollution, urbanisation, construction of infrastructure and the sheer press of people are obvious and important. And there are just some pictures to remind you of the, the state of, uh, of the UK. The picture on the left there, for example, is the Lake District. That's air pollution in the Lake District, which you would might think would be uh, the last place you would expect to see that level of air pollution. And the other pictures speak for themselves. There are a lot of people in a lot of places and we leave a lot of garbage and we have a big impact. And that has a serious impact impact on nature. On the other hand, despite that, uh, the, 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 the changes in agriculture that have had the most widespread and damaging effect on UK wildlife over the last 150 years. This is not an attack on farmers. The changes have been allowed, encouraged and supported by government policy and farmers are, are rational businessmen and women. But in the, in the intensely farm landscape, there isn't much space for nature by any stretch of the imagination. Let's go back to Rothschild. In the middle of his life, uh, in the early 1900s, uh, th th there was a very, very benign agricultural matrix. That's the pale green area uh, on this uh, highly stylized map. Um, uh, and between 1870 and the Second World War, agriculture had been in serious decline, in serious depression, lots of abandoned land, uh, increasing the, the, the marginal, lots of marginal land, the workforce in agriculture had declined by 43%. And so, the, 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 as well as the, the sort of significant natural sites, agricultural land was very, very favourable for nature. And between 1870 and 1940, it thrived. Ian Newton calls a period between 1950 and 1970 in his wonderful Farming and Birds in the Collins and New Naturally series, uh, the post-war farming revolution, in which mechanisation and chemicalisation of agriculture began to increase rapidly. And so the, the agricultural matrix became increasingly less favourable for nature and many of the sites identified by Rothschild as being important for nature have become national nature reserves but they were often reduced in size and there were still some pockets of unfarmed land but nothing like as many as there used to be. By 2000, uh, the agricultural matrix was now extremely hostile for wildlife. Many, but not all, sites for nature conservation uh, uh, of any value had some level of protection, um, but they're often much reduced in size. So paradoxically, from about the late 1800s, although the number of protected sites increased in the second half of the 20th century, the area of land available for nature decreased. The surviving sites became more isolated and we made less space for nature not more and inevitably species decline both in variety and abundance. The fate of Dorset Heathland around Pool Harbour is typical and I'm sorry I couldn't find one to illustrate where you live. Uh, I'm sure there are and in fact I've just asked Ian for some examples. But this is what happened to the Dorset Heathland uh, from the time of Thomas Hardy uh, in the top left hand corner uh, to the, the, the 1970s, late 1970s, early 1980s where the Heathlands were, I love the word, reclaimed for agriculture. Uh, <laughs> well, it was never ours in the first place. The reclaim for agriculture and concreted over the towns of Poole and Bournemouth became increasingly fragmented and the populations, the meta populations, the connected populations of organisms that were able to move freely across that heathland uh, in, in the early days became increasingly difficult to do so. Surviving populations became more isolated and many went extinct and that happened to most habitats over most of the UK.
But gradually, conservation has moved from just preserving, hanging on to what we've got, to include both preservation and restoration of sites outside existing nature reserves. And those recreated sites are now shown on this map in pale blue. It's not possible to define with any certainty when the first deliberate large-scale habitat recreation projects took place in the UK, but it's not as novel as you might imagine given current interests. From the early 1990s, 40 years ago, we can identify a growing number of habitat restoration and recreation projects putting nature back into the landscape. What's different now is the sheer scale of the exercise. The government's stated aims and objectives are for a nature recovery network based on the Making Space for Nature report that I did over a decade ago. Irrespective of whether any of that actually happens, and I don't have time to consider and weigh up just how serious the government is, but I think they are serious, the voluntary and private sectors are already doing and planning a huge amount. And it's these efforts of the voluntary and the private sector that gives me real hope. And interestingly enough, there's no central register of the scale and extent of habitat restoration and recreation in the UK. But we know it's big. We might just have turned the corner, putting more habitat back than we're destroying by land sharing initiatives. That is putting nature back into working landscapes of farmland and forestry and even urban areas and rewilding. Let's have a look at what's going on. Examples of land sharing, putting nature back into working landscapes, there are too many to list them all. There are farmer clusters initiatives, which are co sort of co-supported by DEFRA uh, and, and the, the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. Uh, voluntary, voluntarily, groups of farmers are working together to put nature back into their landscapes. The National Trust has some major priority habitat initiatives on its land holdings. Jordan's, far, Jordan's Farm Partnership, Jordan's Porridge Oats, uh, has asked all its farmers to set aside uh, a, a significant proportion of their land for nature. The Wildlife Trust Living Landscapes and now 30 by 2030 is the latest wonderful major initiative which is what this particular evening is about. RSBB has been doing futurescapes. There is a major initiative going on in Cambridgeshire called Natural Cambridgeshire to double the number of wildlife sites in the county. There is a new super national nurture reserve on the Purbeck Heaths. The Yorkshire Peat Partnership through the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust that I'm president of is a major project restoring hundreds of square kilometres of eroded peatland in the northern Pennines. And T-Swale Naturally Connected is another one that I'm involved with, 850 square kilometres again in the northern Pennines. And there are many, many small schemes, uh, one that I'm involved with close to York, uh, and uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the plant life has led to the creation of a, similarly about 5,000 hectares of new meadows since 2013 and the one the picture there is of the Robsford Asms uh, Hagwood Meadow just outside York which is set aside 10 hectare or former barley field set aside and there are these initiatives are happening all over the country it's very very exciting the living landscapes uh, you know about that, that that's the wildlife trust have been doing some wonderful work on that over time uh, and here's some just some examples the recreated hay meadows by the cumbria wildlife trust in ravenstonedale the huxtowell marsh is a newly created wetland at pottery car uh, the yorkshire wildlife trust that, that that that's nearly a kilometer across both ways it used to be uh, rather indifferent farmland breeding bitterns breeding marsh harriers there now uh, the, 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 the Suffolk Wildlife Trust uh, has, uh, has, has led the way with another massive habitat restoration and recreation on the Carlton Marshes. Uh, the, the pale green areas to the left there are, are three kilometres north to south. It's an enormous area of new habitat. And the Wildlife Trust vision is to do more and more of that, 30 by 30, a commitment to raising 30 million to put nature into recovery across at least 30 percent of the land and seas of the United Kingdom. And basically, Boris Johnson has picked that up and said, we are going to do that. Typical Boris Johnson, nicking somebody else's ideas and taking the credit. 
the Warwickshire Wildlife Trust plans, which I absolutely think are wonderful. You're ahead of the game. Is to double your land managed for wildlife by 2030, create a thousand new air, air, hectares of habitat with three million pounds of funding. And just think, repeated across all 47 trusts when we finally catch up with you, how amazing that's going to be. And we have a proven track record of how to do it. We know how to do it and we know we can deliver. The UK's first super national nature reserve was announced in March 2020. It's just over 30 square kilometres, made up of three existing national nature reserves, other local nature reserves, and part of the corridors is a golf course. Why not? There's nothing wrong with making a golf course into a wildlife corridor. Uh, and the partners, a huge partnership, but again, is the way forward. We have to work in partnership. You can see the partners there, including the Dorset Wildlife Trust, uh, creating this fantastic 30 square kilometre reserve and despite its size that isn't actually rewilding it's getting close to rewilding but it's not actually rewilding because it has clear conservation goals what we've been doing in nature conservation this is a highly stylized diagram along the bottom there you've got the percentage of land under cultivation this is in a particular region or county or what have you uh, from no land under cultivation in the bottom left there to 100 percent of land under an agri environment agri environment deserts on the top right uh, and then on the on the uh, vertical scale you've got the percentage of semi-natural habitat which of course is the inverse of that and what we've been doing since Rothschild's meetings in 1912 is uh, that the, the landscape has progressed with the, the progression of progress has to be being up and to the right increasing agricultural intensification and what conservationists have been doing is trying to move everything down to the bottom and the left uh, to, 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 to create nature reserves, the big blob in the middle, cultural landscapes with land sharing, you know, in agriculture, rich landscape, wildlife rich agricultural landscapes anyway, and then rewilding at the bottom. Uh, and so we really are beginning to move dramatically down into the rewilding scale. Rewilding, or wilding if you prefer, has no generally agreed definition, interestingly. My own thinking is it starts at a scale of roughly 10 square kilometres and over 70% of wild land, but scale is not the main distinction between rewilding and land sharing. Unlike land sharing, rewilding is not goal orientated. It aims to let nature get on with it over as big an area as possible with as little human intervention as possible with the virtue of the whole area devoted to wildlife conservation rather than other forms of land use. More succinctly, Alistair Driver, the director of Rewilding Britain, defines it as the large scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature can take care of itself. And I prefer those definitions to what the definitions of the extreme rewilders, uh, because they don't do these ideas any favour in the eyes of most of the public and policymakers and politicians, for whom the term has a scary connotations of bears and wolves rampant all over the place. We can do really effective nature conservation without having bears and wolves, perhaps one day, but not yet. Rewilding initiatives in the UK, roughly in date order, uh, the Nepa State in Sussex, well, the Wild Ennerdale, Dunregan in, in, in Glen Afric, the CCI Endangered Landscape Programme that I chair with is in the Cairngorm 600 square kilometres and a whole lot of other sites that are beginning to enter the fray. The story of NEP, the first one really in Britain, is inspirational. It's 25 miles from Gatwick Airport. If you can rewild there, you can rewild anywhere. It has breeding white storks now, five pairs this year, a purple emperor butterfly flies, uh, turtle doves. It's an amazing area. Uh, it's only 14 square kilometres, 25 kilometres from Gatwick Airport. If you can do that there, you can do it anywhere. So what we're doing at the moment in conservation, uh, there's the area of the sites along the bottom. It's a logarithmic scale, so it goes 0 0.1, 1, 10, uh, 100 square kilometres and so on. And the management intensity, how much effort we have to put into managing each square kilometre uh, on the vertical axis. Traditional nature reserves are up in the top left hand corner there. And what we're increasingly doing is moving down the scale into increasingly large areas with increasingly letting nature get onto itself. There's NEP there, Wild Ennerdale, the Yorkshire Peat Partnership, uh, the Endangered Landscape Programme sites. Just for the hell of it, I've put Yellowstone and Okavango on there. There's the two with the world's major wilderness areas. And we're really beginning to move from the top left to the bottom right in nature conservation in Britain. And I find that fantastically exciting. Any questions? And um, we're not going to do questions now, are we? Ed? We're going to do questions later. Thank, thank you, John. Yes, yes, we are. Thank you ever so much. And um, I perhaps should have said that at the uh, 
introduction actually we're very grateful that John's going to stay on and um, uh, take some questions uh, uh, I'm going to ask Ian now if he can load up the presentation that he and I will use um, I'm going to um, run through a little bit of that and then hand over to Ian and then we'll have a question session at the end and the way to ask questions is if you can type them into the into the chat and uh, and then Philippa will join us at the end my colleague Philippa Arnold will join and um, and um, and uh, present the the questions to the panels so thank you once again John and um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes now to um, to before, well, before I hand over to Ian to explain how we see Warwickshire Wildlife Trust playing its part in our county in tackling the nature crisis, I'm, I'm going to spend a few minutes to look back over, over time. Because while it's very important to focus on what else needs to be done, it's also really, really important not to lose sight of what has already been done. For the crisis that we're engaged with would be so much worse without the efforts of so many people over such a long period of time and you know in, in the context of this wildlife trust this organization by a long time i mean 50 years um the 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 warwickshire wildlife trust was was founded in in 1970 although its roots go back uh, uh, in time a little bit further than that um but in the period covered by the slide you're looking at now you know this charity started to save special places in Warwickshire, Coventry and Solihull and to do that it needed staff and it needed a headquarters and it needed some equipment and as you can see illustrated in this graphic it spent uh, a period of years uh, acquiring acquiring those and then in the next 15 years it did more of the same it added more sites it required more staff and more resources. Um, income was raised through uh, the operation of some gift shops. I mean, those are now discontinued, but they worked for a while. And through the creation of a, a trading subsidiary, which still operates as an ecological consultancy. And to this day is a major source of income for Warwickshire Wildlife Trust. Other notable landmarks in this period were various campaigns, the opening of two visitor centers and the establishment of our education program. What started in 1970 with eight members began this period with 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 10,000 and over as, as time went on and over the next period we continued to stand up for wildlife uh, locally but increasingly taking a uh, a role in national issues such as badger vaccination and, and HS2. But these, the most recent 15 years really saw the, the real start of our work at a landscape scale with initiatives launched in the Tame Valley, the Prince Thorpe Woodlands and, and also in Coventry. And of course we reached a real landmark in 2020 with our 50th um, anniversary celebrations. But what, what, what did all this mean on the ground for wildlife? Well, to use John's phraseology, you know, these 50 years were the Trust's preservation stage and the next few slides celebrate what was achieved in that and what Ian is going to take you through is the next stage, the restoration stage. But what did the preservation stage mean? Well it was during this period that Watcher Wildlife Trust acquired and safeguarded the best examples of, in this case with this slide, ancient woodland in our area and then managed them to preserve and enhance their features. We have 11 sites of ancient woodland, they cover 389 hectares, but to set that in context we estimate that in 1890 there were 8,000 hectares of ancient woodland in the county and since then we've lost about 900 hectares or, or a bit over 12 percent. So it, it shows the scale of our, you know, the, the efforts of Warwickshire Wildlife Trust and all its supporters and all its volunteers were considerable but that just sets, sets the scene. And it was the same with, with wildflower meadows. Nationally we've lost 97% of our wildflower meadows um, but that's not to say that um, but the Warwickshire Wildlife Trust has been very busy conserving the best examples and in recent years we've started to collect seed from meadows that we have saved and use though that seed to re 
to improve other sites such as Dunchurch Meadow through the spreading of Gree Hay and that's what's going on in the centre slide at the top. Recovery is also possible and perhaps the most dramatic habitat creation um, we've managed to deliver has taken place on old industrial sites which are often threatened by uh, development or conversion into other forms of land use and we you know some of our best sites now fall into this category and of course you know Brandon Marsh is probably the exemplar of this although there are several others um, and some are very recent um, the slide in the bottom right is a, is a site just over the uh, River Avon that we acquired in 2018 so the habitat creation there you can see in that bottom right hand picture is less than three years old. We do a lot of work on rivers as well um, across the county and across Coventry and Solihull, Solihull, restoring natural processes sometimes by regrading riverbanks or by installing woody debris. Uh, we, uh, at certain sites we create complementary wetland habitat in the floodplain such as wet meadow, um, that's what's going on in the bottom right hand slide there which is a bit of habitat creation uh, adjacent to our reserve at, at Hampton Wood or pioneering work to tackle invasive species and that's what's happening in the slide on the bottom left where our former colleague Tarek is heroically tackling some Himalayan, Himalayan, Himalayan balsam. <laughs> um, the Trust Estate is now about a thousand hectares. Um, that's a lot of land and as John has explained or introduced and as Ian will take you through in more detail we're, we're looking to uh, to extend that and to double it but even with that amount of land clearly we can have a much bigger impact for wildlife by working with others to help manage their own land and that's the rationale behind our work with farmers. Our, our work with farmers reaches across possibly 10,000 hectares and by supporting them to make space for nature and to integrate environmental measures into their own farm businesses we've generated um, really good results for owls, sparrows and, um, and, and various other species and habitats. Over the past 50 years we've saved and safeguarded a number of sites in urban areas throughout our patch. Without our work to manage them and to engage local people in these sites they would have been at risk of further development but now they're wildlife havens right on the doorstep of where most people live. And recently with a great understanding and acceptance of the role which natural processes can play in solving some of the challenges society faces. We have been busy promoting and delivering nature-based solutions, creating a diversity of habitats in the landscape and slowing water flow, reducing flood risk and trying to avo avoid um, or ameliorate what's happening there in the centre top uh, slide of flooding at Falongi. Occasionally this work has taken a species specific um, focus and the two best examples are our, walk with, uh, are our work with water voles uh, where it's a nationally threatened species and in Warwickshire we're down to the last few colonies. Um, in order to support those colonies we have improved the habitat and constructed water vole hotels and increased the overall area which is suitable for water voles to live and we have helped them uh, extend their range. And where we can, where we've been able to improve habitats sufficiently to make reintroductions worthwhile, we've carried those out as well. Um, the best example of that is our reintroduction of, of dormice, which was only possible because we were able to acquire Bubbin Hall wood and Bubbin Hall meadow. And on the meadow, we created new habitat and that linked Bubbin Hall wood, Wrighton wood and Rothenbury wood and gave habitat of the sufficient quality at the right size that made the introduction of dormice feasible. We did that in 2018 and we're absolutely delighted to be able to report that we now have breeding populations of dormice in that connected landscape. So that really is a very whistle-stop tour through 50 years of effort on preservation. Uh, but as John says, as John Lawton said, it's not enough, okay? We need a restoration phase and that is where the Nature Recovery Fund appeal comes in and I'm now going to hand over to Ian to take you through a description 
of what we plan to do and why we plan to do it. Thank you. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Ed. So, um, as, as John and Ed have, have uh, articulated so well, the, the Wildlife Trust here in Warwickshire has had a huge impact over the last five decades, thanks largely to the dedicated support of our volunteers and the support of our membership and the hard work that the staff have put in. But unfortunately, despite all of that impact, engaging with lots of people, inspiring uh, the next generation and uh, trying our best to uh, halt species decline, the overall picture is not a positive one. And as John highlighted, uh, the UK is now regarded as one of the most nature depleted countries on earth. And it's not an exaggeration to say that unless we do something urgently, we're on the next, uh, on the verge of the next mass extinction. And if you put that into context, you know, the last global mass extinction of species was the dinosaurs. So we are at a, at a tipping point really where we need to act now uh, to scale up our e efforts to reverse this, this widespread decline. Without the work that's been happening over the last five decades in Warwickshire uh, and more over a longer period of time across the rest of the country, we're obviously in a lot worse state than we are now. But in moving forward, we need to, to up the game and to improve on a bigger scale the impact of our work. The, the, the headlines really, depending on uh, you know, wherever you look, actually are not good for wildlife. 15% of all species in the UK is an, under threat from extinction and a number of species have already gone extinct. Uh, and as, as has been discussed already, there's a number of factors that are combining to, to create almost a perfect storm, challenging species and pushing them closer to extinction. Uh, some of our rarest species are threatened by multiple factors that are driving them. And a, a kind of a, a new kid on the block, a, a final nail in the coffin, depending on what analogy you want to use, is climate change. And here in Warwickshire, we've worked with uh, research students to, to assess the potential impact of climate change and if um, a, a simple two degree warming occurs in Warwickshire um, then it could put a number of species on the brink of extinction uh, and this slide highlights the fact that a number of these species to everybody on the street don't necessarily mean a lot there's not many people that care a lot about millipedes or centipedes but these species are the base of the food chain and they actually have significant impacts on the things further up the food chain that rely on them. You know, a lot of people relate to and, and can, can sympathise with the plight of something like a water bowl when it becomes uh, on the threat of extinction. But actually, it's the species further down the food chain that we need to have, have equal kind of urgency in trying to save because they have such a bigger impact on the wider, wider species connectivity. And humans obviously, of course, as well are impacted by this. One in three mouthfuls of food that we eat is, is, is grown as a result of pollinating insects. When you take a, a moment to consider what you had for your last meal and how much of that food is, is brought to us as a result of nature, it's really an absolute travesty that the wider society doesn't play a, a, more, a, kind of a, a more significant role on the, on the role of nature in our daily lives. Essentially, we're at a tipping point now. Um, you know, the, the graphs are not good and they're all going in the same direction. Uh, and if, unless we rebalance nature with the world and create a more sustainable future, we're on the, on the verge of something that may be irreversible for future generations. And they may look back and say, well, why didn't you do more? So here in Warwickshire, we want to play our part within the Wildlife Trust movement of upscaling our efforts, uh, recognising everything that's happened before, but changing something and saying today is the start of a new beginning. So what does that mean? Well, the Wildlife Trusts have come up with this ambitious new strategy, which hopefully uh, people are becoming more and more familiar with now, and that is the concept of 30 by 30. And what that means is 30% of the land and sea area across the UK supporting nature's recovery by 2030. That doesn't mean to say that we need to own everything or designate everything as a wildlife space, but what it means is that everybody can play their part, no matter how small. So whether you live in a, in a block of flats and have a window box, whether you've got a garden, a farm, a local authority green space, a county or the entire country, we can visualise what 30% of that area might look like and try and make space for nature in that patch to, to play a small part. And through collective small actions together, we can reverse the tide and change the direction of, of nature's decline and bring wildlife back. So here in Warwickshire, the Wildlife Trust is looking to lead from the front of that with our ambitious new plans for land acquisition and habitat creation. 
But alongside that, we need to continue working in partnership with other people, inspiring people to make space for nature and take them on that journey. Because on our own, we're not going to be able to achieve that. The first question obviously people ask is, well, if you want to get to 30 percent, well, what's the state now? Where are we currently at? And luckily in Warwickshire, we are really well blessed with data. Uh, we've worked for a long time now on assessing the level of natural spaces on our patch. We have a team within the, uh, the organisation that is called the Habitat Biodiversity Audit Team. And as the name suggests, with audit in the title, their job is to go out and survey and assess what wildlife habitats are across the area. And they've been doing that now for over 20 years. So we have an unrivaled data set that's actually regarded across Europe as being a, an exemplar best practice of, of what you should do to record habitat. And what that tells us, it gives us a, a time log of how habitats have changed over that time, but it also gives us a really up-to-date picture of what the current state of play is for nature on our doorstep. And by looking at the, the, the areas of our nature reserves, the areas of environmental stewardship, forestry, green spaces, and other, uh, other data that we have available, we can assess what each local authority is currently and where the collective is. And it shows that you know, <clears throat> our current state of play is 13%. So we've got a long way to go across that patch. And even if you take one example like Rugby Borough, um, you know, everybody has collectively got to do a lot more. So essentially where we're at now is a bit of a, a kind of a crisis point, a critical part of, of the, the journey that we're on, that we need to make a decision. Do we carry on on the path that we've been working um, trying to safeguard the rarest sites, preserving those as kind of relics of the past where nature hangs on by its fingernails, which unfortunately will lead to a, a continual decline if society doesn't change as a whole and overall species will continue to die out across the landscape. And that might start chipping away at our own nature reserves as we have you know, freak events or local extinctions that are unrecoverable because the species just aren't there out in the wider landscape to recolonize. Or we could try and ramp up our efforts and try and buy more land at scale, carrying on doing everything that we're doing now and working in partnership in a small way with other, other partners and acquiring more land and trying to double the area that we manage. But if that doesn't result in overall changes of behavior, we're only gonna sort of shallow that curve and perhaps bring some species back or stop some extinctions, but not necessarily reverse the overall trend. So what we think we need to do is to, to, to be ambitious, to reach for the stars and to say, OK, how do we change this? And we change this by doing everything that we've been doing already, by increasing our ambition to do more and to take and inspire people on that journey with us. So that collectively society, one in four people starts to take action for wildlife, recognising that nature is really important to our lives and can make the difference to humans as well as uh, having a role in the world itself. So how do we reverse wildlife decline? Well, this is the point where you need to hang on to your hats. It's about to get technological. I have uh, gone into the depths of my PowerPoint knowledge to come up with this fantastic diagram that hopefully tells the story of what we're trying to achieve. So this, this green circle here shows a typical nature reserve with some species that are uh, found on the nature reserve in the habitat. Surrounding that nature reserve is an area of land that's perhaps less hospitable for wildlife. The landscape has been degraded from a wildlife point of view because of intensification for agriculture. Elsewhere in the area, we might have some larger nature reserves that are better linked into their landscape. Perhaps they, they fall within a living landscape area like the Tame Valley, where we've been working at scale to try and put nature into recovery. And as a result, the species in that area have a bigger area to operate within. And that supports a larger colony. The species can increase their population. They become more robust and more preserved and protected from local declines. If we're able through this new initiative, the 30 by 30, to acquire land at scale in the right places, not only can we create new habitat for species to exist in those areas, but we can enable the species to connect at a scale that we've not done before. And if you take that example on and, and start to think about the kind of the ecological principles that underlie the science behind what we're trying to do, we might have sites where there are, are existing populations of wildlife that are surrounded by that area that is not great for wildlife in a, in a farm landscape or other reasons, such as the, the barriers that might be there, such as HS2 preventing species to, to move through the landscape. And then you might have other nature reserves that are brilliant for, for wildlife, but for whatever reason don't have that species there. 
maybe because it's had a local extinction and because the surrounding area does not have other populations, such as the dormice that we that Ed talked about in the last few slides, that remains isolated and the perfect home for something, but not a home currently. If we're able to acquire land in the right locations that would act as a stepping stone, some of the more mobile species uh, could use the, the new habitat that we've created as a stepping stone for them, and then also colonize those new habitats or those existing habitats on our nature reserves. So by doing it in that, that approach without necessarily directly connecting sites, we're able to create movement within the landscape, which is absolutely critical, particularly when you start thinking about the, the warming of the global warming and the potential for species to need to move to new areas if the conditions where they're currently found uh, are become problematic. We're really gonna build on this now and I'm starting to, to really use my PowerPoint skills to make this point. So we've got a, a bigger area uh, here with, with a, a much more robust population of species. And we're going to bridge that to enable the species to colonize as we've talked about before which is helping to create new habitat therefore creating an overall increase for the amount of area that wildlife can can use as part of its um, recovery in Warwickshire, Coventry and Solihull. But we've got to recognize that actually not everything goes to plan and in some circumstances there are some things that are beyond our control. Some of these species are really quite vulnerable and climatic changes or weather patterns in any given year can have a real impact. Barn owls are a great example of that. They rely on having a food source at the right time of year to be able to be in breeding condition to breed and, and to keep their population high. If you have particularly wet weather while a barn owl is trying to put on breeding condition or it's trying to feed its young, it can't fly. And wet weather can also have an impact on its prey species, predominantly small mammals that might get flooded out or washed away. And as a result of that, in any given year, their species might start to, to decline in its population. If we have local extinctions of any specific species, then the good work that we've done to create the habitat has unfortunately not resulted in that population staying. But you are able through the connectivity in the landscape to enable those species to recolonize using natural processes of moving through the landscape. So once the habitat is right and we're managing it in the right way, the whole ecological unit, the, the species, the, the individuals that are living there, whatever they are, whether it be mice or birds or butterflies, are able to just recolonize oh, through an area using the corridors that are created in the landscape. These could be hedgerows, they could be rivers or canals, or sites where they step along on the way. So bringing that into kind of the reality, how are we looking to do that through this strategy? Well, this side, slide shows uh, Brandon Marsh, our headquarters, uh, the, the visitor centre and the offices at Brandon Marsh is, is circled there in red. Um, surrounding that, and Brandon Marsh has been a site for the Trust now for obviously a few decades. Surrounding that in recent years, we've started to add uh, other sites to that. So to the north, we now have Piles Coppice and Brandon Reach, which was added to the, the Claybrooks Marsh site that we also had to the north of Brandon Marsh. Highlighted in red up there, the large woodland section is it's Brandon Wood, and that's managed by a local volunteer group, independent of the trust, without us having to, to be involved in the daily management, therefore playing their own part in nature's recovery in 30 by 30. And as Ed mentioned in one of his slides, Wolston Fields uh, is, a, is a reclamation site for gravel and sand extraction. Those are the two areas highlighted in pink to, to the southeast of Brandon. And they're going to be coming on board, creating complementary habitat as part of the restoration process for Brandon and the surrounding area. But what's really exciting as part of this 30 by 30 idea is the opportunity to consider the sites like Brandon Wood Golf Course, highlighted there in blue, and Sheepfield, highlighted in yellow as potential additions to a site to make it much more robust as an ecological area and, and the opportunity to restore and re-naturalise a golf course into a, a, a wetland mosaic is obviously hugely beneficial for wildlife. We've looked in other parts of the, the county opportunities and, and trying to be proactive in identifying where we can have the biggest impact. So this site is Leamington Spa. On the edge of Leamington Spa you've got our Lem Valley Nature Reserve which is highlighted in a thin red line there. To the south of Lem, Lem Valley, we've got one farmer that uh, manages land highlighted in the red block, and there's a much larger farm highlighted in the purple block to the north. Both of these are potential opportunities to have a conversation with, where 
we don't necessarily need to buy the land. It could be about influencing them to change their management practice. It could be about looking at long term opportunities for working more closely. But when you think about that at scale and then you factor in that the, the white and green area where Observation Hill is written is another golf course, which is no longer uh, viable. This is New Bold Common. That suddenly the, the opportunity to, for species to increase their range, have habitat restored at scale is quite significant. And what an opportunity for the people of Leamington to have that on their doorstep. <clears throat> so the next question is, well, what habitat are we going to create? And I think the, the thing to be clear about with this is that we're not going in with a preconceived idea of trying to create specific habitats as part of this process. So this isn't necessarily a tree planting initiative like there is so much talk in the media now about you know, replanting trees everywhere. For us, it's about creating the right habitat in the right place that links into that wider landscape thinking. So we've got an example on the left hand side there, the woodland that Ed, Ed mentioned about we created additional new woodland next to Bubbin Hall, which enabled us to do that species reintroduction for dormice. On the River Sherbourne, we've created new wetland habitat alongside the river to create more of a, a natural wetland ecosystem, benefiting the species that are associated with wetlands like otters, kingfishers, dragonflies and various other things. And then in other parts of the county where we've got strongholds for the last remaining wildflower meadows, we've been focusing on trying to restore those. And there are opportunities if we're acquiring land next to our existing nature reserves that are wildflower meadows to do wildflower meadow creation. And the next question linking back to what John said is, well, you know, is it rewilding? There's a lot of, a lot of information in the news about rewilding at the moment. It's a very, you know, a buzzword that is often used by by leaders in, in, in the politics or, or councils to, to talk about how things happen. For us, rewilding, as, as was explained, needs to be done in the appropriate ways. There are kind of a sliding scale of rewilding from the, you know, the beavers and the bears at one end through to promoting natural regeneration and, and working with nature as much as possible at the other end of the spectrum. And then obviously beyond that is the habitat creation itself. Our approach with this, this area of work is to be acquiring land at scale and then creating habitat in the right place, but considering how best to create that habitat. In some instances, it might be through physically creating the habitat, using machines, volunteers, and giving nature a kickstart. In other areas, it might be through a combination of allowing natural regeneration to occur, seeds to come over from a neighbouring woodland, uh, wildflower meadows in the soil to, to be re-established that may have laid dormant through previous management practices. And the key thing to say is that data in all of this is absolutely key. I mentioned it earlier that we have the Habitat Biodiversity Audit team that go out and survey habitats and show us where things are. And that's really crucial about making informed decisions because we're able to know exactly where all the woodlands are, actually where they were because of historical mapping as well, which helps us identify where the best places to recreate woodland would be because it's already been there in the past. We've got better knowledge now than ever of, of urban habitats and we're able to map urban habitats at a, a scale at the garden level that we've not been able to do because of advances in technology. And through our local wildlife site network, we've got a great understanding of where the best habitats are that we don't manage because whilst the Warwickshire Wildlife Trust managed 65 nature reserves, there's a huge network of local wildlife sites that are regionally important for nature conservation, but are in private ownership. And they can play a role in this uh, jigsaw of, of nature's recovery in their own right. In terms of where we're going to be prioritising the, the kind of the approaches and the, the opportunities to try and acquire land, whilst three million pounds, if we can get there, is an awful lot of money, when you start to look to how much land costs, it doesn't go very far. So we need to be selective. We need to prioritise in the right way to make the biggest impact for nature. So we're going to be targeting land that is struggling to function in the way that it is at the moment. That might be through golf courses that are no longer viable because of flooding or through the, the business model is just not, uh, not work for them. It might be farmland that is also difficult to grow food on. It could be land that's been cut off by HS2. Perhaps the, 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 the train line is proposing to go right through the farm. And it's no longer viable as a working farm. So there's lots of opportunities for us to consider how best to do this, as well as um, trying to link into our existing nature reserve network. 
So kind of in summary, what we're looking to try and do is to continue to manage our own land, recognising actually the sites that we've got are still some of the best sites for nature conservation across the patch. <clears throat> to continue to help others manage their land for nature's recovery and make space for nature on their land. Because we can't do this on their own and actually uh, nature will, will uh, operate at a landscape scale. So it's no good for us just to, to try and manage our sites and not work with farmers and other landowners. But by creating that new habitat, it gives us that extra Im impetus and that drive to, to continue to, to bring wildlife back. So <clears throat> that's an overview. And what our intention is, is that when we start to identify some of those parcels of land that we're looking to, to acquire, we're going to obviously update supporters with that information, with a lot more information about the sites we're looking at, the detail of the, the timescales that might be involved, and start to take the local community on that journey with us because it'd be really important that the local community input into their ideas about what can be created there and we work with the local communities to create the new habitat and bring wildlife back but as you hopefully know by now and, and part of the reason why you are hopefully on this call we we launched the fundraising appeal on the 30th of march uh, and we already had over one and a half million pounds secured uh, through legacies and generous donations from corporates uh, through uh, gift aid from Middlemarch, our environmental consultancy, and a few other sources. And we're looking to try and double that to give us you know, the momentum we need to try and reverse nature's decline and double the area of land that we manage for wildlife by 2030. What we need really though to make a big difference and to change the scale of the impact and the, the, the spread and the reach of, of, of our appeal is to get our supporters to help us spread that message. We know that people are passionate about wildlife in, in Warwickshire, Coventry and Solihull and that you can play a part in telling the story of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, have a conversation with people you know. If you are part of a network, then put forward our appeal um, to those people. If you work for a company, uh, talk to them about whether they can support us as a charity. We're, we're very keen to go out and support and talk to clubs and other organisations and to explain our message and how they can be a part of nature's recovery themselves. There's obviously a key fundraising ask and a key part of tonight really is to keep people in the loop about what we're trying to do and to, to not be scared from a charity's perspective of asking for your support. We do need vital funds to make this happen. So we're asking people to pledge money, either as a one-off donation or to, uh, if they can afford it, to pledge monthly, recognising that we are in difficult financial times. Um, but we believe that nature can play a role in nature's, uh, in humans' recovery. You know. The, the latest COVID situation has highlighted that access to nature on your doorstep can play a huge role in people's mental and physical well-being. And over the next few years, the NHS is going to be under huge unprecedented pressure as it tries to deal with the backlog of COVID. So we need a natural world that can help support the NHS by playing its part in people's mental and physical well-being. And there are many other benefits that we'll be talking about over a series of webinars throughout the year, where we'll look at things like health and well-being, and carbon capture and the role that this sort of approach can take in a range of other things as well as nature's recovery. So we've now got some time for questions. Um, we said that the, the, the webinar would uh, end at eight o'clock. Um, what we're going to do is uh, gather all of the questions through the Q&A, select a few questions for, for pitching to the panel tonight and then if there are any unanswered questions from that, we will follow up via email for the people that have answered those questions. So everybody who asks a question will get an answer either live tonight or um, following on from email. So. Thanks, Ian. That, that, that's, that's great. Thank you very much. And um, I've, I've got a list of the questions in, in front of me. Um, and I think we'll just dive straight in. Um, I've got one for John, for you, John, um, from Jane Jones. I'll read it out. Now that after breakfast, did I say breakfast? <laughs> now that after Brexit, we are no longer tied to the common agricultural policy. What advice would you give to the government on how to use farm subsidies to support wildlife and nature? 
Hey, you're very prescient. Uh, I, I I had an hour and a half on a Zoom on a on a on a Zoom call with 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 Defra this morning um, about that exact question, <laughs> which is uh, uh, I, I, that last week I had one with the Secretary of State himself. I I, I spent a, a long time with his officials this morning, pointing out that uh, and actually the Treasury and the government really do seem to have got it. They're free to invest in things that they were not free to invest in. Uh, in in lands in land management, and they're thinking about no longer. Well, they're not thinking about. It, they've essentially decided they're no longer going to subsidise farming. They're going to pay farmers to deliver societal goods, clean water, uh, carbon storage, uh, tourism, and, and so on and so forth. So there's going to be some fundamental changes in the way that government is investing in agriculture, and it will not be simply subsidising farmers by the acres they own or manage. Uh, it will be real public payment for public goods and the government have got that great thank you um ian i was going to pass one to you now um given the spatial demand uh, this is a question from alistair schofield given the spatial demand from the human population for accommodation business food production and recreation is there sufficient space left to significantly restore natural populations by land sharing and rewilding I think that's a, that's a great question and that, that sits at the heart of the 30 by 30 uh, idea really in that we recognise that actually land for nature's recovery doesn't have to be exclusive for nature's recovery. Oh, exactly. uh, as we've discussed in the past, uh, the, the areas that are protected for wildlife play a huge role and they're the sort of the jewels in the crown if you like. But actually for nature to recover at scale, we need everything to be playing its part. So whether it be a housing development, whether it be a farm, whether it be somebody's garden, you know, those sorts of developments shouldn't be a, a barrier to nature's recovery. They should be incorporating them in. And there's interesting, um, you know, things happening at a policy level with things around the, the new Environment Act that's coming out, the, the post-Brexit legislation, uh, you know, and the likelihood that that's going to require any type of development to have biodiversity net gain, which essentially means that a developer, if they're building, say, houses, would need to look at the area they're building houses, work out what the existing value for wildlife is, and then whatever they, they design in terms of their housing estate would need to deliver at least 10 percent. And it can be calculated using um, <coughs> surveys more wildlife than was there before. So that is a, is a concept of how you can integrate in wildlife into everyday thinking. And we're very keen that, you know, our, our new campaign can create some more um, sort of examples that we can lead from the front on. But our work can't stop there. We need to work with with housing developers, with farmers with whoever it is that is managing and influencing land around the country not all of which we'll agree with and you know in some circumstances if development occurs we need to be strong to say that shouldn't happen but if it is going to happen in places where it's being perceived to be okay we need to still get the best outcome for wildlife uh, so i think everybody can play their part we're certainly trying to influence at a kind of a policy level and with strategic decisions with other people but going back to what i said in my part of my presentation you know, whether you have a window box or a garden, you can still play a role in this as well. And it, it would be great to, to be able to work with local communities to, to make space for nature too. Thanks Ian. Um, I think we've got time for one, one more question and I think it's only fair that I ask it and try and answer it myself to give, <laughs> to give John, John Ian a bit of a break. So it's Tim Sinclair's question. Can an area be wilded and still made accessible for people to enjoy without harming the flora and fauna? Yeah. And, and, and Tim, I, you know, my short answer, well, I'm going to have to give you quite a short answer to that just in the interest of time. But my my one word answer is yes. And, and I think it's essential that it is. So the the, the, the notion that in order to protect and uh, enhance wildlife, that uh, that it's necessary to exclude people, I think, is now completely outdated. It was a somewhat traditional approach. Um, you know, it was an approach that let's be honest you know the wildlife trusts pursued back back in time you know it was, it was that it was at one point it was in vogue that in order to do right for wildlife you had to keep people out i mean our our thinking now is completely different to that um you know we we followed david attenborough's mantra that if people don't know or care about something they will never be interested in preserving it but we take that even further we think it is in the interests of people's health and well-being that they have close and intimate contact and access to 
uh, to natural spaces and to uh, the, and have the means to enjoy wildlife. And yeah, you know, I, I personally I would go so far as to say that I think that is a human right. You know, everybody should have it. Everybody in this country and everybody in every country should have that. So. Um, there may be occasions where, because an area is particularly sensitive and a species is in such dire straits that it is necessary to relieve the pressure by, um, by excluding access um, and in order to allow recovery and, you know, and, and ensure preservation. But I would argue that, you know, very, very strongly that that should only be a temporary measure. You know, with such access comes great responsibility that people visiting those places act appropriately. Um, those of us, including myself, who have a dog and who like to exercise our dogs in natural areas, we need to control our dogs so that they don't um, scare off ground nesting birds and, and cause their, uh, their broods to, to fail. We also need to take our litter home. We need to stick to paths so that our, uh, our enjoyment and our access for, for such areas are... Uh, are not causing damage. But, you know, with, with all those caveats, I think the answer, Tim, to your question is yes, absolutely. That is front and centre of the Wildlife Trust approach. And, um, you know, we, we're doing it as much for people's access as we are for the, for the wildlife in question. So thank you for that, for, for that question. Um, there was a little bark of approval from somewhere. Uh, <laughs> gonna lead. Anyway, um, we, we, we're pretty much bang on the hour now. We're a minute or two over. So I would like to say to everybody who's, who's still on the call, we've had just over 50 people take part in our session today. Thank you ever so much for, for joining us. I hope our presentations have, have been clear. Um, uh, there were a number of questions that we didn't really have time to get round to. As, as Ian said, we will be responding to each and every one of those via email if you could give us a couple of days to to do that um and if for any reason you you know uh we, we fail to do so then please do get in touch uh, with the trust and we will make sure that you you get an answer um that's it i'd like to bring the webinar to a close but just with a final note of thanks to sir john for giving us an hour of his time um and for a, a, an inspirational and highly explanatory presentation at the beginning and also thanks to ian and thanks to Philippa, who none of you have seen, who have set up the set up the webinar in the background. Um, thank you. Um, enjoy your enjoy your dinners, and um, and see you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.